Now for our webinar. I'm delighted to introduce Wesley Koo, Assistant Professor at INSEAD. Uh, thank you, Robin, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Wesley, a rep at large at DES uh, ENS interest group at uh, SMS. Um, so for today, that's the second webinar of our series. Uh, I'm very delighted to welcome Professor Panish Pranam from INSEAD. He is the uh, Roland Berger Chair Professor of Strategy and Organization Design. Uh, he has written an extensive amount of work on the topic of organizational hierarchy. And today, that's precisely the topic he is going to talk to us, to, uh, talk to us about. Uh, so, uh, Panish, uh, do you want to take it away? Thank you, Wesley. <clears throat> Thanks all for joining this webinar. Um, I'm going to be talking today about organizational hierarchies uh, with a little bit of an overview of the research that my collaborators and I have been doing on this topic for the last few years. So when I say hierarchy, what I'm thinking about, and I'm assuming you're thinking about the same thing, is the typical pyramid-shaped structure of delegated formal authority, the kind that we see in reporting structures or in org charts. And that way of organizing large numbers of people into organization systems has become a default template. Uh, and this is true whether we're talking about the, the public sector or the private sector. Other forms of organizing do, of course, exist. But uh, for most large scale organization, hierarchy seems to have become a taken for granted default structure. Now, just to put that a little bit into perspective, it has captured our mind as the default structure, but this is a relatively recent thing, right? Now, of course, recent depends entirely on when you start the clock. So why don't we start the clock at about 200,000 years ago when Homo sapiens as a species uh, appears to have diverged from the ancestral line. And we're not quite sure if it's 200,000 years or 300,000 years, but what we're reasonably certain about is that until the uh, agricultural revolution, which is about 13,000 years ago, there's very little evidence of any large multi-layer hierarchical structures of any kind in traditional societies. And between 13,000 years ago and roughly about 400 years ago, the only places we did see uh, organizational hierarchies were restricted to the church, the military, and the state empire. The kind of widespread application of hierarchy beyond church, military, and state is really something that's happened in the last three to four hundred years. Uh, roughly speaking, I would take it from the East India Company, right? But not really much before that. So, if you put that in perspective, if the day begins at at uh, uh, twelve in the morning then uh, 12 noon, then essentially it's really around 11.58 the next morning that organizational hierarchies kind of show up in the, in, the, in the lifespan of human history. So it's not as inevitable as one might think, given we see them all around us. And looking forward again, given the advances in the fourth industrial revolution, particularly intelligent automation and AI, which might do many things that managerial hierarchies currently do, there's again no reason why it should be inevitable going forward. So what, what my collaborators and I have been trying to do is to try and understand how hierarchies work, how they don't work, of course, which is important to understand. What are some substitutes for hierarchies that we already know about? And can we create a framework for some disciplined speculation about what might happen to hierarchies as technologies ago? So that's going to be the broad theme of my discussion today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. I hope this works. So broadly, I have uh, four things I want to cover. A topic like hierarchy is inherently challenging. It's a complex thing. And we sometimes don't make it easy on ourselves by also being quite undisciplined about the terminology. Uh, people use very different words to mean the same thing. They use the same word to mean very different things. So I'm, I'm not going to try and persuade you to adopt my way of talking about it, but I do want to share what it is so you know what I'm saying. And that will take a few minutes. So I want to start first by laying out a few terminology and definitional points. I'll quickly review results from two prior streams of work I've been doing in this area. One pertains to what I call the surprising effectiveness of dumb bosses. So one of the most surprising things about authority is it can be quite an effective institution and organizational design principle, if you think about it, without necessarily being invested in the wise. So you can have authority and wisdom quite divorced from each other 
and the former can still be fairly intact. I'll talk a little bit about alternatives to authority. What are some of the things we've learned over the, over the last few decades of research by many people uh, and the last few years from my collaborators and me in terms of what are some robust alternatives to authority? And finally, if I have time at the end, I would like to get a little bit more in depth into one paper, which is a new paper I'm quite excited about. This is still a working paper called Scaling Flat. It's about understanding organizational growth without hierarchical growth. This is joint work with uh, Ong Man Lee, the professor at NDU. And uh, uh, since this is jointly hosted by entrepreneurship and strategy, I thought this paper's topic might be of some relevance to both constituencies. Okay, so a couple of definitional points before we go further. Uh, this is taken, uh, most of the ideas here in this definitional part are taken from chapter six of my book, Microstructure of Organizations. So when I was writing that book, one of the first things I realized was we didn't really have a clear and sharp conception of hierarchy. It means very different things to very different authors. And when such a situation arises, it's usually helpful to retreat to first principles. And I found that actually there is a pretty well-developed theory of hierarchies as partially ordered sets in mathematics. And there are ideas there which are actually quite useful for us, particularly if you combine them with graph theory. So here's the standard language I'm going to use. And this is fully consistent with the way some of the classics in our field have used it. I've just tried to make it a bit more explicit. So when I say hierarchy of authority, I will specify that's what I'm saying. But for the moment, I'll just talk about hierarchy, a more abstract construct. And it's a pattern of dyadic relationships. Uh, that is, it has the following features. Firstly, it involves asymmetry, by which I mean that um, you get the property that if A has this relationship to B, it will rule out the possibility that B has a relationship back to A. Okay. Um, it also has the property of transitivity. That if A has a relationship to B and B has a relationship to C, it implies A has a relationship to C. So just to give very concrete instances of both of these, think about weight or height. So if A is taller than B or A is heavier than B, it rules out the possibility that B is heavier than A. That's asymmetry. Transitivity. If A is taller than B and B is taller than C, then this implies A has to be taller than C. And lastly, acyclicality. There should be no path that cycles back, right? For instance, the link C back to A cannot exist in the pattern from A to B to C. Right? So this is ruled out. Uh, in fact, it follows from asymmetry and transitivity, but it's worth stating it explicitly. So these are the three basic properties for a hierarchy. Okay. And it can be also equivalently presented in something called a directed acyclic graph. So these things are really equivalent. That's the most abstract definition of a hierarchy. Now, of course, in management and organizations, uh, we often have related constructs, which are almost but not quite the same thing. So for instance, the notion of a tree is, is very intuitive to us. In fact, many reporting structures are presented this way. But what I've shown you here are two pictures. This is from chapter six of my book. Uh, on the left is a tree that's not a hierarchy. And on the right is a hierarchy that is not a tree. The difference arises because the picture in the left, you can see that the arrows are symmetric. And as you saw from the previous slide, you need asymmetry as one of the defining features of a hierarchy. The picture on the right is a hierarchy, but is not a tree. And the reason it's not a tree is if you look carefully, you can see this individual has two parents, right? And this is actually an interesting feature of hierarchies. Nothing in their formal definition rules this up. So matrix organizations where you have two bosses, is indeed still a hierarchy. Okay. Um, so in our context, of course, we talk about different hierarchies, sometimes without being super clear about how different they are. For instance, think about social hierarchies. So in the case of a social hierarchy, the key dialectic relationship is that uh, A has greater rank on a valued dimension, which could be power or status or wealth than B. Uh, this is often used to understand the informal social organization. You can have a containment hierarchy where A is a superset of B. And this is the one that most people remember intuitively from Simon's classic piece in 1962. Uh, this is often used to think about nesting structure or even to describe taxonomies. We have influence hierarchies where the key relationship is A influences B's 
beliefs or behavior. Uh, authority is really an instance of this because authority is a form of asymmetric influence. So A can legitimately demand obedience from B in a particular domain. That's a classic definition. So that's an influence hierarchy. And you can also have a task hierarchy where uh, A provides necessary inputs to B. So think about Thompson's work on pooled sequential reciprocal interdependence, or even Simon's work on the two watchmakers who are trying to build more watches to make sure that they can build the most before a shock hits them. Uh, these are about workflows. Right? So increasingly, I think there is recognition that these are distinct. So we might be using the word hierarchy for all, but we should not be. Right? In fact, these things are quite distinct from each other. That's one of the increasingly important things that's coming up uh, in our context. Now, just to put this in a little bit of perspective, I'm going to show you a picture of a modern hierarchy, if you like. Right? This is a fairly traditional log chart. It's a matrix structure at Procter and Gamble, and uh, this was in the year 1987. Since then, PNG structure has moved on quite a bit. But the reason I show you this picture is if you look carefully, uh, it has all the four kinds of hierarchies, perhaps more that I just mentioned. Right? So there's clearly the reporting hierarchy, the influence hierarchy. As you see here, there's a president, then there's a division vice president, then a director, and so on. There's the uh, containment hierarchy, which is the grouping structure. And you can see that the grouping in this case is jointly split between product divisions and functions. Right? There's also a social hierarchy, I'm sure, of relative status, which in this case might coincide with the title of authority and influence hierarchy. And finally, there's a task hierarchy, which is the flow of materials and information through manufacturing to R&D and sales. So in this case, that task hierarchy might even look orthogonal to the reporting structure or to the containment hierarchy. But my point with this illustration is very simple. When we look at a picture like this and say, that's a hierarchy, we're really pointing to a bundle of different hierarchies. So at a minimum, we should be very precise about which hierarchy we're talking about. The one I'm going to be talking about are, uh, is authority hierarchy. And uh, that's the focus really of, of the kind of work that I've been doing in my colleagues. Uh, also a little bit of distinction here between the term authority and hierarchy. Some also use this interchangeably, but authority is really a building block for a hierarchy of authority. Because a hierarchy of authority is a pattern, right? It's a acyclic graph, as we said, in which the dyadic relationships are asymmetric influence relationships. Okay. And that are then cascaded through delegation. So this is again a very important distinction, if you like, between formal hierarchies and informal hierarchies. So hierarchies of formal authority have multiple layers for the simple reason that delegation produces the transitivity it's much harder to delegate informal authority, which is why you don't see multi-layered informal hierarchies. You see formal hierarchies, which are multiple layered, but it's rare to see multiple layers of status uh, or of uh, expertise, which are, uh, which are suitably delegated, in part because these things are in the eye of the beholder. Right? So it's very difficult to ensure everybody sees the status ordering in the exact same way. But the key point I want to leave you with here before I end my discussion on terminology, is that for the most part, we want to understand hierarchies in terms of these basic properties of asymmetry, of acyclicality and transitivity. We're going to be focusing on authority hierarchies, which is really a particular form of an influence hierarchy. And authority is a building block, which then aggregates up to a multi-layered hierarchy through the process of delegation. Uh, maybe I should stop here and see if there are any questions. Leslie, do you see any? I don't see any questions so far. Um, so in the meantime, I just want to encourage everyone to post questions if you have any. Yeah. Okay, great. So let me move on to the to the first set of results. Which uh, Panish, there, there, uh, there's yeah. actually one question. There's sure. one question, yeah. Just came in. Okay, which types of hierarchies did you come across most of in your studies and research? Um, all of them, right? And I think, in fact, the typical challenge I faced for my colleagues and I faced was realizing, it took us a while to realize that they're actually looking at multiple hierarchies in the same context. So 
uh, one of the most frustrating conversations I've had is with colleagues in neighboring fields who are also studying hierarchies. But for instance, social psychologists are very interested in status or in power hierarchies. Right? They're often interested in informal organization. But the kind of definition of the key asymmetric construct they're looking at is ranking on a value dimension. Whereas what I'm interested in is asymmetry and influence. And these conversations sometimes have led to dead ends without much progress, at least for me. Uh, but I think increasingly there is recognition across fields. And in particular, I would, I would point to a very nice paper by Stuart Bunderson and colleagues in AMJ 2016, where I think they make the first very explicit attempt uh, in the field of social psychology to distinguish these different forms of hierarchy. In particular, they distinguish the acyclicality property, which is um, a characteristic of influence hierarchies from the possession of valued resources, which is what social psychologists have traditionally been interested in. So uh, the short answer really to your question is, we see them all together, all the time, all bundled together. And the real challenge actually has been disentangling them. And that's what we're trying to do. we have two more questions, uh, short questions coming in. How about political hierarchy? Yes, so uh, political hierarchies have couple of different forms. So to the extent we're talking about the administrative hierarchy of the state, then that is again an authority hierarchy. It may also have properties of containment hierarchy and so on. If you're talking about uh, rank ordering of political power, right, that looks more like a social hierarchy because it's merely a ranking. It's not necessarily influence. So when we think about political hierarchy again, I think we run into the problem of perhaps multiple kinds of hierarchy but. Uh, what about the idea of uh, fiat in transaction cost economics? Excellent question. It is equivalent to authority, right? So nothing in the notion of fiat necessarily talks about a multi-layered structure. It really refers to asymmetric transitive dyadic property, which is the same as authority. Uh, and then what about nested hierarchies? Yes, so containment hierarchies, for example, departments, divisions, teams, these are, these are nested hierarchies, but they don't necessarily imply influence, right? So that's the point. You can have coexistence of these hierarchies in the same social system, but we have to be clear which one we are studying and what we're trying to say about it. So that's the reason why I'm insisting on trying to separate each part. Okay, shall I move on? Yes, please. Okay. So the first pattern of, of results I want to share with you has to do with the fact that there is a reason why these authority structures have become so widespread and are so, so uh, dominant in our thinking and have become such a legitimate default template. And that has to do with the fact that they work quite well, even when the person at the top is not necessarily very good, right? So think about the pointy head boss in Dilbert. Uh, there's a reason that that character exists and is quite stable in our uh, cognitive ecology because there are properties of the authority relationship and of hierarchy, which allow it to be quite effective despite not having any particular superior insight at the top. And this has been a problem that's bothered me for a long time because uh, I would like to think about organizations as marvels, but not miracles, by which I mean that uh, when individual members in an organization have these properties of limited rationality and inability to see the future or compute endlessly, why do we then assume that the designers of these organizations are somehow exempt from these limitations? Right? They're just as human. So if the members of an organization are boundedly rational, so are the designers. And the miracle for me lies in the fact that in the aggregation of many relatively simple-minded entities, the aggregate can produce intelligence and adaptiveness that may not be reducible to any individual entity. That's the beauty of organizations, right? So they're marvels, not miracles. So to understand them, we have to drop, I think, the baseline assumption that the designer is some heroic modeler who can you know, exactly calculate the marginal cost of everything, set up the ideal principal agency contract and then slot employees into it. That's a useful, useful theorizing device, but as a descriptive model of how organizations work, it's not one that I felt particularly ever very satisfied with. And going down this path of trying to understand how structures such as authority and hierarchy can be effective, even when the agent at the top is not particularly smart enough, or more informed or more knowledgeable than anybody else in the system. Uh, that has helped, I think, for, for me to understand at least why these systems might be so robust and so stable. Uh, 
So let me give you a couple of concrete instances. In a lot of the papers in this stream of work, what my collaborators and I have tried to do is really run this contrast between these two structures. Right? So a complete peer-to-peer -peer system and a system with some degree of uh, authority, with some central, centralized authority in the hands of a few. And the specific mechanisms are different in the different papers. They're not all the same mechanism. But they do point roughly in the same direction, which is something like this. Uh, maybe I should give you a concrete example. It will see the it will see the general point. So let me focus for a second on this paper, which is about how initial representations shape coupled learning processes. It's a theory paper, and what we show here is that when agents are engaged in interdependent actions, but they don't really understand the nature of that interdependence, there's a real danger in the learning process of being trapped by superstitious learning. So the analogy you might give is if you're trying to break a code. So there's a code, the code says, if you hold up a red flag and I hold up a green flag, then that's the winning combination. But we don't know what the winning combination is, right? So we don't know how our actions are integrated. So this is a very simple analogy for something like product design, or even for strategy policy choice, or uh, even for um, uh, administrative choices in different departments of different companies, the same company and so on. But the core idea is, there is some combination of actions that outperforms everything else. We just don't know what it is. We have to learn by trial and error. And the problem in these situations is that the errors can be miscoordinated, right? So suppose the winning combination was green and red, and you pick green, and at the same time, I actually pick blue. So this does not win, you get a bad outcome, and you decide not to pick green again. So this is essentially a false negative. Right? Because you had picked the right color, but you, because I didn't, the overall feedback was poor. So this is a very common problem in situations of interdependent learning. And what we show in this paper is that uh, if you have a centralized source of authority, for instance, which imposes the same common beliefs on all actors, even if that belief is false, it actually helps the system. Because their errors are then coordinated and you don't get false negatives. You only get true negatives and true positives. So that's a very general property and it has some resemblance to the classic story that Karl Weick used to talk about, about the soldiers who were lost in the Alps and found their way out using a map of the pyramids, right? So the fact that they had one central source of belief, even if that belief was false, that can have this uh, adaptive effect on the group is what this model tries to show. Uh, a more recent version, I think, of the same idea expanded to the network level is this paper. Uh, which really is asking, how can organizational design ever be effective, given that the designer, as I just said, has the same boundary rationality limitations as the members? Right? So unless the designer is somehow a superhero and can see things nobody else can see, uh, how can design ever be effective? And what we try to show here is you don't need the designer to be a superhero. Even completely randomly imposed structures do something. So what do they do? So the entire model turns on one simple idea. The idea is to form a network tie, it takes two. But to break a network tie, one is sufficient. Right? So it takes two to tango, but one to dislodge the relationship. Now, why is that important? What structure can do is actually force people to interact. Even if the interactions are utterly valueless. They may be a complete waste of people's time. But in the absence of a forcing function like a structure, those interactions would never occur. So what you end up seeing is this kind of division of labor between the structure and what the informal organization does, where the formal structure forces people to interact, but then the agents make up their own mind, is this working for them or not? And they can discard the ties that don't work for them. And that combination beats a system where it's just the formal structure, but just the informal structure on its own. So again, the designer need not be particularly smart. This has got to be as good as random. And still it turns out to produce performance that is substantially better than that. Uh, a more recent paper in the same stream is work with uh, Uskijan Kocha at entire Leventhal. This is still a working paper where we're trying to show under what conditions hierarchies hate adaptation. And it's quite intuitive that if you face a pure search problem, then the wisdom of the crowds or communities, it's quite intuitive to expect they will do well and they do. If it's a pure coordination problem, right? We just got to get everybody lined up in the same direction. It's also intuitive that hierarchies will do well. The really interesting question is what happens when you face as an organization a joint search and coordination problem? So people have to find the right set of actions, 
and they also have to converge on it. And it turns out in these circumstances, hierarchies do remarkably well. And we show this with a number of different versions of hierarchical structures. Uh, I will not get into the details of that model in this, this talk. But what I do want to highlight is that even in that case, the apex agent, the person at the top of the hierarchy, is no smarter than any other agent in the system. So it's a pure effect of the pattern of hierarchical structure, not about the properties of the individual. So it's a pure structural or topographical property. So I think all of these go towards making one simple point. There is a reason why authority and hierarchy structures are so widespread. They have become a very powerful way to coordinate large numbers of people. We don't really have that many credible alternatives. And their abiding power does not depend as much as we might think on appointing the truly competent or the truly exceptional individuals at the top. Even in the absence of that sorting process, the structure alone carries a lot of the burden of, of making things work. Uh, let me again pause here and see if there are any questions or comments on what I've said so far. There is one question from catering to the previous section, Anisha, from uh, Simantini. Okay, yes, so there's a question here about what about influence and workflows that can and do flow, th flow in both directions. Sure, so we can have influence structures and workflow structures which are not hierarchies because they would have symmetric flows or they may not even be transparent. Uh, all I'm saying is for influence and workflows, there are also some patterns which are hierarchies. Okay, so maybe I move on to, to the third part of what I want to address, which is some substitutes for formal authority. Um, this is again, a topic that has been exercising my collaborators and my thinking for quite a while. Um, some of these are pretty obvious and we can't claim to being you know, the pioneers and having thought this out. So for instance, substitutes for formal authority are quite well known. Right? These include bargaining power and expertise related status. So, so there's no law which find the, the principal and agent to create the structure. But at the same time, there could well be ex, uh, superior bargaining power or there could be superior expertise. And think about Linux Torvalds in the, in the Linux community, right? So this person doesn't have any formal authority over anybody in the system. He's just first among equals. But his expertise based on his extraordinary contributions and his, uh, the huge respect that people have for him is remarkable, right? Of course, it does not produce a, form, a, a hierarchy for the reasons I mentioned earlier, because informal authority is hard to delegate. So Linus Torvalds might take a liking to me tomorrow and appoint me his successor, but this is not going to cut the mustard for most people in the coding community, right? because I don't necessarily have the legitimacy to inherit the mantle of the great man. So this is a fundamental difference between turning authority into hierarchy when the authority comes from a formal source from an employment contract, because then it can be delegated almost infinitely, contractually, and from an informal source where it really cannot. That's one of the reasons these two are different. But the idea that you can substitute formal authority with things like bargaining power and expertise, that's completely. A slightly more radical question is, what is the substitute for authority itself, right? Whether it's formal or informal, doesn't matter. Uh, what's the substitute for authority? And the more we've thought about this, the conclusion we've come to is that this is really asking the question, how do you manage conflicts without relying on authority? So this is a bit of a leap and I want to make sure that whether I convince you or not, I want to explain why we make this leap. If you think about what authority really does in social systems, what it does is it resolves conflicts. By conflicts, I mean disputes and exceptions that arise either explicitly or implicitly for either reasons having to do with cooperation or cooperation. Right? It's a pretty broad bucket. Basically, any form of disagreement in a group which cannot be resolved peer to peer. If you think about that as a conflict, that's what authority steps in to resolve. If everybody agreed, there would be no need for authority. If everybody was of one mind. So my favorite counter thought experiment to make this point is to think about the, the, the Star Trek community called the Borg. So the Borg are this species of uh, aliens who all have the same mind, 
and therefore all have identical information, identical interests and incentives. There's zero conflict. So they don't need any authority structures because they never disagree about anything. Right? But the moment people have differences in interests and differences in, in, in incentives, conflict is inevitable, whether it's explicit or whether it's dramatic or more subtle. And in part, or in a large part, I think what authority does is to manage those. Now, if you agree with that, it then follows, and this, we've seen this in a number of studies, that there are at least two very robust ways to manage systems without reliance on authority. And these often go together. The first is self-selection. So if you let people make their own decisions on which tasks to allocate themselves to, this often creates a high level of intrinsic motivation, but also an ability to coordinate peer-to-peer, -peer, which then makes the reliance on authority less important. And this often goes hand in hand with the modularization of work. So you can decompose things to such an extent that conflicts are limited because conflicts arise when there are interdependencies. So self-selection and modularization are often very powerful ways to accomplish many of the same things that you would otherwise need authority for. So to give you some concrete examples here, um, these are papers in which we've tried to study basically these flat systems without a formal authority structure and try to understand how do they end up still working as cohesive systems? How do they solve the basic problems of organizing, of division of labor, of integration? And some of this I've, I've looked at at the ecosystem level, like meta organizations, but uh, some also at non-hierarchical firms like Wall. But more recently, we've been studying this also in online communities. And maybe I'll take a minute to talk about the most recent paper in this, in this stream. Uh, which is literally accepted, I think, last week, so it should become more soon. Essentially. This is about resolving governance disputes in online communities. So the problem in this case is that online open source communities have to make one very important strategic decision in their life, which is what sort of a software license to be adopt. Now, this is critical, as you can imagine, because depending on what you pick, uh, you may or may not be able to keep it open source and free. Right? And you may or may not be able to allow others to build effectively on it and leverage it. So it's a fairly contentious discussion sometimes. And we were interested in how do we resolve this given there is no formal authority or any authority really. Maybe it's expertise-based authority, right? That's a possibility. But of course, Linus to Awards is special. Not every online community has one. So we're really interested in how, how this might be working itself out in these systems. Uh, this paper is also, I think, a bit special in the sense it's not only about this topic that I care about, it's also the first application of a methodology that my colleagues and I have developed, which uses machine learning to find patterns in the data and then build a theory using human thinking to explain those patterns. And then ideally in the last step, test it out of sample in a new data set. So this paper is an inductive theorizing paper. We haven't done the last step of testing out of sample, but we do use machine learning to find patterns in the data and we do find some surprising factors, including the fact that in this context, the likelihood of the dispute getting resolved actually increases with the size of the group. Right. So if you have read about the literature on groups and disputes, this is bizarre because normally group size is a negative predictor of dispute resolution. It gets harder to get people to agree when there are more of them. Right? You just have to go to a department meeting. But what's interesting in this context, as it turns out, is that when groups are large, statistically the chances of at least one individual in the group being able to transpose the discussion from a debate about alternatives, which is which license should we pick, to a debate about attributes, right? What are the attributes we're looking for? We're looking for openness, permissiveness, backward compatibility. That conceptual transpose is more likely to happen if the groups are large, because just statistically the probability of one individual making that mental leap goes up. Now that by itself is not enough because you could easily imagine this and I'm sure we've experienced this. We could end up spending half an hour arguing about which candidate, then we switch to attributes, research, teaching, service, and we spend another half an hour arguing about which attribute is important. So the first step, which is transitioning from thinking about alternatives to thinking about attributes, is necessary but not sufficient. It turns out the second step relies crucially on self-selection. So one of the things we do know about open source communities is they tend to attract people who are actually quite homogenous in what they value. At an abstract level, they care about a few things in common, including openness and policies, right? These are properties of the license they look for. 
So the way these systems are resolving these disputes, which are very fundamental disputes about the governance of the community. If they don't solve them, they die basically, the, the community will disappear. But they do solve them without explicit reliance on authority, largely because the self-selection into the system already creates a high degree of homogeneity on what attributes they're looking for. Once they have that, all it takes is for somebody to transpose the problem from a discussion about alternatives to a discussion about attributes, and then they do reach resolution. So that's the theory we could induce from this context. And I think it illustrates this general idea of self-selection. Uh, but that idea is also very prominent, I think, in, in some of these papers uh, that are cited. If you're interested more, by the way, in this algorithm supported induction for building theory, the same co authors and I also have a paper which is currently still a working paper, it's on SSRI. But it walks you through and it also offers the code if you want to do this yourself with data to first look for patterns using machine learning, build a theory to explain them, and then split the sample and test it out. Uh, so let me pause here and see if there are more questions here. Mr. There's one from Jenny, one from Asim. How about culture as a substitute for authority? Uh, yes, that's a real possibility. So there is actually a project that one of my uh, PhD students who was in the market last year uh, has, uh, has dealt with exactly this question. So a lot of these non-hierarchical companies like Wolf or like uh, GitLab or GitHub, um, it's not clear exactly how they're able to manage without a hierarchy, even after they scale to a particular size. But one possibility exactly is that their culture is special. So what Ariana did was uh, she actually managed to get data from Glassdoor, the employee review agency, and we have an agreement with them and they've given us their entire database of 5 million reviews. So what she can do using that database is construct an aggregate picture of the culture of these companies based on what employees write about them. So there are lots of issues with that, of course, but you know the alternative would be to interview or to survey a few people. Here at least you have scale and reliability. And what she can show is that these non-hierarchical firms, when you compare them to a match sample of more hierarchical firms, tend to have much more cult-like cultures. So I'm using the word cult-like carefully. I don't want to be, uh, I guess, sued about this. But essentially what it says is that people tend to be fairly homogenous in what they believe and they care about, I should say, believe is too strong a word. They tend to be quite homogenous in what they care about. And they also tend to care about a few things. So this property of narrow focus and high similarity in what people care about as expressed in their reviews seems to capture that their culture is a lot more cohesive. And this is distinctive of non hierarchicals uh, Another question I see here is, could structure also explain things like discrimination, where discrimination is inefficient but persistent? Absolutely. So uh, let's be clear, I am not at all a proponent of hierarchy for its own sake. In fact, even when hierarchy is solving problems of coordination well, it's also perpetuating many problems of inequality, right? And this is one of the reasons why I think it's very important for us as organizational scientists to think hard about, could we design an alternative to authority-based hierarchy to coordinate equally large numbers of people, right? That's the challenge. And I think the reason we should do that is in part because hierarchy perpetuates inequality and it can perpetuate other forms of discrimination. Yes, it's a great, great system for coordination, but it has come at a cost, right? And I think technologies are evolving today, which might allow us to reclaim back systems of organizing that don't rely on such extensive multi-layer uh, Andy has a question. Yes, so Andy raises a very interesting question, which is about um, the process by which the design is put in place and the design itself. The two are separate, right? And you're right. So you could have a design in which there is no authority. It might be pure consensus, right? But how is that enforced? And that is exactly where authority might become critical. So the most amazing thing about some of these non-hierarchical organizations is, is not that they have a non-hierarchical or a non-authority based system, but why everybody continues to adhere to it. Right? Why can't people simply say that I just don't want to uh, sign up to this anymore? The rest of my colleagues might say we should do X, but I disagree. So then, what do you do? Right? And that's what makes these systems and their self-enforcing nature really important. And uh, without that self-enforcing property, I think it's kind of hard to see 
credible alternatives to authority or hierarchy. So things that I've mentioned, like self-selection or, or modularization, they either rely on that trick that Andy mentioned, which is in period zero, somebody with authority sets up the system that way. Right? So Valve is a very good example of this, where the founder, because the founder cares a lot about being non-hierarchical, has designed a system with high modularity of tasks and high potential for self-selection. And now they can walk away and people can continue working without active intervention. But in contrast, if you think about some of the communities that manage common pool resources, right, like, like fisheries or forests or, or farms or water, these are the kind of communities that Eleanor Ostrom studied. There, there isn't a single boss or a founder owner who made up the rules, right? The rules don't have authority inside them, nor do they have authority outside to back them. So they are self-enforced. And those are, I think, particularly interesting examples. Okay, uh, so there's a question also about personal competence. Um, so all my talk about Dilbert's boss, I should not leave you with the impression that I think managers are not competent. That's not my point at all. Uh, they are uh, uh, they're brilliant managers all the time. My point simply is that they don't need to be brilliant for hierarchy to be an effective system, right? That's the point I think is underappreciated. Because of course, you know, we have lots of smart managers. We also have many, perhaps, like in any profession, who are not. And all you have to do is uh, query employees at the lower levels and hierarchies, and you'll hear horror stories in some, if not all organizations. So how can we reconcile that with the fact that this form of organizing is so widespread? And that's the question to which I was trying to offer an answer, that maybe it has something to do with the structure itself, not necessarily the property of the individuals. Okay. So let me move on, uh, and I want to touch on the last part of, of my talk here. I think we're doing well on time. So this is a new paper that I mentioned right in the beginning. It's called Scaling Flat, and it deals with the question of organizational growth without hierarchical growth. So this is a theory paper, and it's joint work with uh, Ongman Lee, who's a professor at NTU, uh, and was a former PhD student. So one of the most robust things we know about hierarchies, hierarchical structures, is the strong correlation between size and number of layers. Right? So this has been uh, found in multiple studies and this is a replication in a survey that Ongman and I ran a couple of years ago uh, using INSEAD alumni. And it's not a very large sample, it's about 250 of them or so. But it shows you the pattern very clearly that it's really hard to escape having multiple layers as you get larger. And this is something that has also been documented in a by other scholars. So what we are trying to do in this, in this paper is to build a theory that explains this slope, right? And in, partic in particular, tries to explain that slope in terms of firm-specific variables. So what is it that allows some firms to grow in size without growing in layers as rapidly, right? So what's the difference between these slopes? What factors explain this slope? So that's the question about uh, scaling flat. So growing the organization without growing the higher. So what factors can explain these differences in the slope of the number of layers with respect to size? So what the model delivers is a few things which we like. So first, it gives us a mechanism for imprinting. So this model offers a reason, may not be the only one, for why early choices about how production is organized is going to shape how the hierarchy will grow in terms of number of layers as well as the span. It also gives us an insight that if you want to flatten a hierarchy or keep a hierarchy flat as it's growing, it's actually as important to create self-contained teams, and I will define this precisely, as it is to create empowered teams. So a lot of the rhetoric in practice is around empowered teams and how to create high delegation context, therefore keep structures flat. But it turns out there is an alternative path where within teams you might see fairly hierarchical relationships. But if the teams are quite self-contained, you will still see flat structures, and we'll show you how. Uh, it also offers an explanation for why technological advancements may lead to either flattening or not. So the classic paper, of course, is Nick Bloom and colleagues' work at Stanford, who showed that improvements in information technology can lead to hierarchies getting flat. But last year on the job market, we had a, a great candidate, Siron Lee, from the University of Michigan. And Siron did a very cool paper on the fact that in the video gaming industry, technological change actually seems to have made startups more hierarchical not less. And we think the, the model we develop here can explain both as two special cases of the same general process. Uh, there's also a property of, of uh, hierarchies which often goes unremarked, 
most existing accounts assume the span of control is constant across layers. Right? And often people even assume a number like seven as if it's a universal constant, the speed of light or gravitation. It's nothing like that. It does vary. And in fact, we have good reason to believe it should vary even within a firm. And systematically so, and the model makes predictions about that. And finally, there's also a couple of uh, papers, for instance, there's a recent paper by Lawrence and Paul, which notes that service sector organizations are more likely to scale flat than those in manufacturing. Right? So if you draw that function, which looks at uh, size on the x-axis and layers on the y, that, that function slope is actually flatter in service sector than in manufacturing. So why is that? And the model, again, that we develop is able to provide an answer. So I'm going to walk you through the intuition of the model. Uh, I've not created into the entire technical details, but I think what I show you will show clearly the basic logic of how we are thinking about it. And then of course you can choose to agree on that. So here's the starting point. How does the number of expected conflicts between N agents, if there are N people, increase with the number of N, right? And your intuition should be pretty good on this, I think, that it's not a linear function. It's going to be an exponential growth function. And in fact, uh, it is a quadratic function. Okay. And the reason we say it's a quadratic function is because if there are n people, each of them can have a fight with n minus one others, can have a conflict with n minus one others. And we don't double count, so we divide by two. And this produces what's known as the quadratic explosion. It's a pretty old idea in organizational design. Uh, and it's attributed to this guy called Guy Kunas, who first wrote about it in So let's say that the number of interactions is a quadratic function n into n minus 1 by 2. Now what's this thing in the front? So think of this as an integration parameter, right, which scales the number of these interactions and converts them into realized conflicts. So n into n minus 1 by 2 is the potential number of interactions. And the parameter 1 minus theta tells you how many of those interactions actually become conflicts. Right? So we'll talk about what theta is in a second, but just let's mechanically see how it works. So suppose theta is very high, it's close to one. Right? So then obviously the slope will be flattened. So the conflicts will rise more slowly. But if theta is low, then obviously the conflicts will go up at a faster rate. So that's why it's useful to think about theta as an integration parameter. The higher it is, the lower the rate at which conflicts increase with the number of agents. Right? So hopefully this part is intuitive. So what is theta? There are two interpretations. We can think about theta as a technological property. It's the property of the task structure. So suppose you think about call centers, right? So call centers have a task structure which is very modular. So because the task structure is so modular, there is very little scope for conflict between agents. In fact, it's so modular that often these are the first things to get offshore or moved off to remote working, right? Because there's very little need for interaction between people. So theta could have an interpretation as a technological property. But you could also think of theta as a cultural property, as a property of the people. So if there's free alignment of values, or there are strong social norms around peer-to-peer -peer dispute resolution, that's also a way of popping up theta. So in the model, because the model is just algebra, we're agnostic to which of these interpretations you take. But once we've proved the core results, we can then look at what theta means and draw interesting and different conclusions based on which of these interpretations. So back to our simple picture here, if the number of agents is n and it's increasing, the number of realized conflicts is a quadratic function, which is tuned by theta. And theta, if it's higher, the integration level is higher, the conflicts go are more slowly. That's the basic idea. Okay, now how can we control these conflicts? So obviously one way to do that is to employ a manager. Right? So this is back to the point I made earlier. One of the most important things a manager does is to resolve conflicts among the subordinates whom they have authority over. So in addition to directly supervising each one of these, they're also managing the interactions between these people, right? So both of these functions add up to consume their capacity, if you like, for managing conflicts. So if this is managerial capacity, let's say it's some constant value. So I'm giving you the most simplest version here. The model has more complications. Uh, that's the capacity of the manager. This is our old function of conflicts we bring it down to the x-axis and that gives you your optimal span of control. So you can solve for that, it's a very simple expression. So this is the expression for optimal span of control. So what does this simple expression tell us? It tells us two things. 
if the manager's capacity goes up, span will increase. If your integration parameter goes up, span will increase, right? In fact, you can see if theta goes up and the denominator goes towards zero, the whole thing will be wrong. So the higher your integration, the larger your span can be. So this is all pretty straightforward. I don't think we've just put it into a bit more of a formal structure. Here's where it gets interesting. What ha happens as we scale and the span of the manager is exceeded? So as the organization grows, let's say we did a startup to begin with, and this was my set of things. But as my startup is getting larger, I hire more people. And now I'm exceeding the span of control of this manager. What's the optimal span? We knew that from this point, right? So given the capacity of the manager and given my integration parameters, which is either a property of the technology or of the culture in the organization, there is an optimal span. What happens when we exceed that? The answer is of course obvious, which is we then add more managers. But that raises another question, which is what determines the span of the apex manager? So we knew the span for this guy was a function of their capacity and the num and the theta that describes them. But what about the cases when we have multiple layers? And the answer is, it now depends not just on theta within, which is within the span of this manager within segment, but also on theta between, right? And that's it. Now we have basically the ingredients to answer our question, it turns out, because the rest is all just algebra. Once we have this basic way of thinking about it, that managerial span is determined by capacity and theta at the lowest level. And when that is exceeded, you add more managers, which means you will have to think not only about theta within, but theta between. The reason being, this individual is only going to deal with the issues that cut across these. Right? Whatever is within segment will be dealt with by the managers of the respective segments. So this guy only deals with things like this. And that requires us to know theta between. And once we have these two parameters, we can be off to the races and kind of simulate the dynamics of the system. You can start like this with a small startup here. After a while, you add more layers, add more people, add yet more people, add yet more people. And so, on. so what this allows you to show quite, quite uh, cleanly and rigorously is that the shape of the hierarchy, by which I mean the number of layers, as well as the span, that both of these depend on the two theaters. Okay, That's really the key point being made here. Now, you can add some interesting intuitions to this. This is a picture showing the equilibrium size of the managerial hierarchy, which is the number of managers divided by total number of employees in a three-layered hierarchy. So this model is simple enough that up to three layers, you can solve everything. Uh, after that, at least not by people with the kind of math levels of me and my co-author, you need significantly better mathematicians. But that's where the computer helps. So for beyond three levels and for the dynamics, we can simulate everything. Uh, for up to three levels, we can prove everything. The results are pretty much the same. And what they tell us is that a lot depends on this interesting expression here, which is called the containment parameter. So if you look at it, what it's telling you is the ratio of one minus theta within over one minus theta between. So if that number is greater than one, what it tells you is most of the conflicts are happening within the team, not between teams. If it's less than one, it's exactly the opposite. And depending on which of these regimes you are in, you also can now see what's the best way to flatten the hierarchy. Because as you go to the darker colors, the managerial ratio is going down. So if you are below the line, you move this way. If you're above the line, you move that way. So to put it in plain English, depending on this containment parameter, it determines as you expand the organization, how to keep it flat is going to depend on either increasing theta within or theta between, but it depends already on the existing values of theta within. This is the same idea with the simulation version. So you can say it's not as symmetric because these are not equilibrium values, but the basic intuition doesn't change. So let me put that in, in uh, very uh, plain terms. This conflict containment ratio, if it's greater than one, implies that managers have to deal with more conflicts within than between teams. And that implies in this model that to scale frat, which means to grow the organization without growing hierarchies, what you have to do is to improve inter-team integration if the containment ratio is greater than one, else you want to improve intra-team integration. Okay. So just to make one very concrete example, suppose the startup was created around product-based structures instead of function-based structures. 
So if you assume that in product based structures, there's more intra unit conflict than inter unit, right? Which just seems a reasonable assumption. Then in this setup, the way to keep the organization flat as it grows is surprisingly to focus more on inter team coordination, making that more effective. Right? That's a surprising and interesting result. But it follows naturally from the marginal returns of the two kinds of investments to either increase theta between or theta. So to wrap that up, I know we have to close in a few minutes and I want to take a couple of last questions. How to be as flat as possible? First, try to stay as small as possible, right? The bonsai strategy. So there's a reason a lot of these non-hierarchical firms like Zappos or Wall and so on, uh, they remain small because being small is one way to stay flat. Right? So that's the bonsai strategy. Second, expand managerial capacity as we climb the layers in the hierarchy. So this is easier said than done. Our estimates show that to really keep hierarchies flat, you've got to be pretty much hiring superman or superwoman at the top in terms of their cognitive capacity relative to the people at the bottom. If this is your primary mechanism for keeping things flat. So this by itself doesn't have that much power, but it helps. The most important thing you can do is increase the within and between segment thetas for two integration parameters. And which one to prioritize, of course, depends on the initial containment ratio. That's the path dependence process. Now, once we have this framework, it's very useful to think in a disciplined way about, for instance, what might AI do to hierarchies? So look at all three factors here, right? If AI leads to automation, then the organization will be small. If it expands managerial capacity, and if it improves integration, all of these things means that hierarchies will flatten as algorithmic technologies replace what managers do. But the flattening does not necessarily mean people will feel more empowered or free from supervision. So extreme supervision and monitoring can go hand in hand, if you like, with extreme. Uh, let me stop there and see if there are a couple of questions to take before we close. Okay, so one question is theta constant or at least changing in a predictable way. In the baseline model, theta is assumed constant. We do think about in the discussion some speculations about how theta might be changing over time. Uh, another question is could theta be something else other than culture or technology interdependence? Uh, we haven't been able to think of a third thing yet, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. I'd be very curious to hear if you have thoughts on that. And I think that's it as well. Uh, Panish, so there's one more question from yeah. Frank. Hmm. Okay. There's nothing in the framework that makes flat desirable. No, nothing in the framework makes flat de desirable in the basic framework. Now you can say the following. You can say that you might intrinsically want to reduce layers to, to minimize communication losses, right? So if you want to try and make the hierarchy flatter because you want to minimize the time it takes to move things from the bottom to the top, one of the ways to get to that would be tweaking the theaters. And that's it, I think. Okay, okay um, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm on mute. Uh, now I'm I mute myself. Yeah, Thank no, you so no, much, no. Panish, for an efficient and uh, extremely engaging session. Um, everyone, thank you for participating. Um, keep on the lookout for more news from the ESNS, uh, ENS group of uh, SMS. We'll have more webinars and other events in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank Robin for setting everything up and especially Panish for staying up so late to speak to all of us. Thank you all. Thank you.